All right, section 14.2, video two. We've been talking about how to deal with limits in a three-dimensional aspect. So this is as x, y approaches something like zero, zero. Again, the first thing you always try is direct substitution. If that doesn't work, we've got a bunch of other things that we could try. Um, but remember the idea is just like in two dimensions where that you have to approach the same limit from both sides, we've got an infinite number of paths that we have to potentially figure out if the limit is going to be the same from every possible path. So in this case, of course, we would get zero on top and zero on the bottom. So let's go ahead and try the x-axis. This is going to end up being an interesting one. Um, so if we try the x-axis, the limit as xy approaches 0, 0. <clears throat> so on the x-axis, that means y is 0, so we get 0 on top of the square root of x squared, which of course is 0. If we try the y-axis, the limit as xy approaches 0, 0 is also going to give us zero in the numerator, but this time it'll be over y squared because the x's are zero. So we still get zero. Let's try this one along y equals x. Remember, what we're trying to do here is basically find one that doesn't work, that doesn't match. It's got to be something that we can actually evaluate. So if we do this along y equals x, um, it doesn't really matter which one we do here. I'm going to plug X, excuse me, I'm going to plug Y in for X. So we'll get Y squared on top over the square root of Y squared plus Y squared. So what you're going to end up with here is, let's see, that's going to make Y squared over the square root of 2Y squared. I can take the square root of the Y part, Y squared part out on the denominator. So y squared over y root 2, one of the y's is going to cancel, which is going to give me y over root 2. So when I plug 0 in there, I still get 0, <clears throat> starting to exhaust a bunch of our normal methods. Um, you could try y equals x squared. You're not going to be able to simplify that one very well. x equals y squared, same deal, because you're going to end up with a y cubed or an x cubed on top, and that's not going to simplify um, you're not going to be able to do much with that because of, you're not going to be able to take a square root on the denominator or something. It, it's just not going to work out very nicely. So there's another way to do this one. So let's start off with the fact that we have xy over the square root of x squared plus y squared. So what we should be able to agree is that no matter what, x value or y value we plug into the denominator, it's always going to be positive because I'm squaring it. The numerator, slightly different. If I take the absolute value of that, now no matter what, I'm going to end up with a positive value. Hopefully that makes sense. And because um, no matter what I'm going to get is positive, that means that that's going to be greater than or equal to zero at all times. Okay. Now let's kind of try and build something here. This is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of xy over the square root of x squared. Okay, that should make sense because what I've done is I've taken the denominator and I've made it a lesser denominator by taking away that y squared, which makes it a greater overall function. So you should be able to, again, see that this one is greater or equal to that one at all times. Okay, what I can do now is I can separate the absolute value on the numerator and the denominator, and technically the square root of x squared part is just going to be x, so I'll have the absolute value of x in the denominator, so pretty much these two things are equal, and then that because the absolute value of x part is going to basically cancel out on the top and the bottom is less than or equal to the absolute value of y. Okay, why did I go through all of this? Well, I'll show you. The limit as xy approaches 0, 0 of 0 
of course, is zero. That's that one. Let's deal with this one. The limit as x, y approaches zero, zero of the absolute value of y is zero. Therefore, since the two on the ends have a limit of zero and everything in between there is technically in between or equal to at worst, any one of these is going to have the same limit. If you don't remember what this is, this is the squeeze theorem. So the limit of the one that we are specifically looking for, our f of xy, as xy approaches 0, 0, also has to be 0. And that's by the squeeze theorem. Okay, not commonly used, but I definitely wanted to show you one. So it looked like all of these things up here were approaching zero, and maybe we might have a hard time finding one that didn't, and there's a reason for that. Every single possible path would lead to zero because we could show it using the squeeze theorem. So if we had tried y equals x squared, x equals y squared, eventually you'd have to figure out that they would all get to zero, and you might have to do a table of values to figure some of those out because they don't simplify easily. But the squeeze theorem still applies. It just applies slightly differently because now we're talking about multiple variables. Okay, we're going to try another one that's some, at least a little bit more interesting. So once again, if you were to plug in zero on top and zero on the bottom, you end up with zero. <clears throat> again, and you should always try that first. Now this one, we could go through and try all of our different things, but this one actually has something I can use the conjugate for, because if you look at the denominator, it's one of those square roots minus one kind of thing. So let's try that. We're going to multiply this by the conjugate of the denominator, which is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus one plus one. Of course, you got to do that on the top and the bottom. Keep the balance. <clears throat> okay, so if you remember, we don't really want to simplify the numerator in this case. So on the numerator, we're going to get x squared plus y squared times that square root plus 1. The denominator is the part that the conjugate is good for. So when you multiply the conjugate, when I multiply the first times the first, that gets rid of that square root, x squared plus y squared plus 1. When you multiply the outside and the inside together using the FOIL method, those are always going to subtract out. That's the purpose of the conjugate. And then you've got the last times the last, which is minus 1. And you can see here that these 1s are going to cancel out. So then I'm going to have the limit as x, y approaches 0, 0 of x squared plus y squared times this square root plus 1, whoops, all over x squared plus y squared. And that was kind of the purpose because and this is why you don't um, distribute anything on the other side because these are going to eventually cancel out. Now you can apply 0, 0, and when you plug 0 in for both x and y, you're going to get the square root of 1 plus 1 is going to be 2. So this one actually had a limit as well. But again, we could actually use the conjugate to do that, so you kind of want to recognize um, that that's what we're doing. Okay, example 6. Okay, the main reason I'm going to show you example 6 is just to show you that you don't always have to follow that pattern that I said, even though it's a good way to go. Again, plugging 0 and 0 in is going to give you 0 on top of 0. So if we follow the x-axis first, that means y is 0. So we'll have the limit as xy approaches 0, 0, <coughs> excuse me, of... Um, 0 on top of x to the 4th, which is 0. 
Now we only need to find one other one other path that's not zero. So you don't have to go to the y-axis if you realize right away, oh, I can see the y-axis is just going to give me zero again. Try something different. Okay, if you try y equals x, maybe that's going to work. Maybe something else. But if you can see it, and if you can see it quickly, skip to one that might actually give you something different. So like y equals x squared. Okay, and the reason I'm using y equals x squared is because I know that from this term right here, if I plug x squared in there, I'm going to get x to the fourth, which is going to give me 2x to the fourth in the denominator. That's kind of the reason why I went to y equals x squared. So you sometimes want to pick the one with the smaller um, exponent in the denominator so you can kind of use that one to make it equal to the other one. Um, hopefully that made sense. But now we'll take the limit. And let's see, if I'm plugging in x squared for all the y's, I'm going to get 2x to the fourth on top. And I'm going to get x to the fourth plus x to the fourth on the bottom, which is 2x to the fourth. So that limit is going to be 1. We found two different ones. The limit fails to exist. Okay, so a lot of times, it's real, again, it's really just about showing that the limit fails to exist. You can pretty much figure that that's going to happen most of the time, but not always. All right, almost done. So now we're going to go back to number four. This is the one um, that we used uh, the um, squeeze theorem on. We're going to do it in a different way, however. We're going to change this stuff into polar. So let's revisit polar. In polar, x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, and x squared plus r on y squared is r squared. Okay, hopefully you guys remember all that. So let's plug those things in and then we'll reevaluate our limit. So we're going to have a limit. So if we plug that stuff in, so we're going to get r cosine theta times r sine theta over the square root of r squared. Now notice I didn't put what the limit is approaching. We've gone into polar now. So in polar terms, r is going to be approaching zero. The radius is going to be approaching zero. And there's really only way, one way that you can approach zero with a radius. That's from the positive side. There is no such thing technically as a negative radius. So the radius here is going to be approaching zero since that's where the origin is. So let's go ahead and evaluate now. So what we're going to have is we're going to have r squared, so limit as r approaches zero from the right, of r squared cosine theta sine theta over the square root of r squared, which is r. So really what that gives us is the limit as r approaches zero from the right, one of the r's from the top is going to cancel the one from the bottom of r cosine theta sine theta and notice here, theta has nothing to do with r, so I could directly substitute r, um, r equals 0 into r, and we are going to get 0. So there was actually another way to figure this one out, and it gives you exactly the same limit. All right, one more um, section to go. And that is to talk about continuity. Good thing is, this is it. There are no notes for this. You just have to understand that the continuity is exactly the same idea or principle as it was in two dimensions, that the limit has to equal the function's value at that point. So if you actually come up with a limit, and that limit is some value L, if you plug in A and B, whatever those values are, you have to get exactly the same L. If that's the case, the function is continuous at that point. That's all there is to um, continuity. It's exactly the same idea. All right, plenty enough for this lesson. Um, you should be good.